Okay, hi everybody, welcome back, and welcome to those who are just joined us for the first time today. Uh, I'm Caitlin McGurk, I'm the Curator of Comics and Cartoon Art here at the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library Museum. I know I asked this at the very start of the day, but now that we're entering the second half, let me check again. How many of you are here for the very first time? <sighs> That's so awesome. That is really, really awesome. We're so thrilled that you joined us. Uh, we weren't sure how those two years in limbo of, you know, the pandemic would, would uh, serve us, but I'm thrilled to hear that so many more people have found out about this show and about the Billy Ireland and decided to make the trip out. It really means a lot to us. Um, so we're entering the second half of our day for talk and teach programs. I want to all men also mention that the galleries are now open for the day uh, from 1 to 5 p.m. today, and they'll reopen again tomorrow at 10 a.m. and remain open until 7 p.m. Um, I'll be around all day if you have any questions about anything, uh, as will my colleague Jenny in the front over here. And there's also folks down at the welcome desk if you have any questions about, you know, local stuff or campus or programs or otherwise. Uh, if you do need to use the restrooms at any point, those are th on the second floor of the building through the double doors at the top of the stairs. Make a left and you'll see them at the right, on the right, and there's a drinking fountain out there as well. So uh, before I introduce our next speaker, I want to quickly uh, thank our sponsors that you can see here and our partner organizations. Uh, thanks to our sponsors, Great, uh, the Greater Columbus Arts Council, the Ohio Arts Council, White Castle, and UBS in particular. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Lee Mars. Lee Mars is best known for the further fattening adventures of Pudge, Girl Blimp. Nominated for a 2017 Eisner Award, Lee Mars was a frequent contributor to Underground Comics and one of the founding mommies of the Women's Comics Collective, as well as Gay Comics. It is a tremendous honor for us to have you here, Lee. So thanks so much for joining us, and please join me in welcoming Lee Mars. <laughs> nice to be here. So... How many of you are armed with tomatoes? <laughs> so I'll look out for you. Um, how many of you make comics of any kind now? Yay! Congratulations. Um, so <clears throat> how I got into comics. Um, I found that storytelling has fed me for my whole life. Um, like most people, I, I intended to be something that I never was. I was going to be an editorial cartoonist. And uh, when I was senior year in college, I was wandering around, looking around, and uh, Herb Block, who was then the editorial cartoonist for the Washington Post, came to speak on campus, unbeknownst to me. So I had always done cartoons for every school newspaper, and I went to many, many schools. My dad was in the military, so I had a lot of experience with that. Um, and so the editor of the school paper brought my cartoons after the talk to her block. <clears throat> and Herb looked them over and said, have this guy see me <laughs> when he graduates. <clears throat> and uh, so that's happened my whole life. Only my stint with women's comics uh, <laughs> was I not misidentified. But actually, that was good, because when I got into the business, into the art business, uh, only men were hired. I had people tell me that there are only guys in this office, and so they would feel uncomfortable if there was a woman. And I had folks look at my portfolio and accuse me of stealing the art from a guy uh, various terrible, insulting things. But this was back before there was even a word for sexism. Um, nevertheless, I persevered. <laughs> um, and how I persevered was by mailing in my samples, not coming in personally. 
And so after they had seen the work and evaluated it and given me a call, uh, that was when I got a chance to uh, get a job at, for CBS News as a graphic artist in Washington, D.C. How I got into comics was through my roommate, my college roommate. Uh, she's Barbara Blaisdell, still my best friend today. And her dad, Tex Blaisdell, drew backgrounds for Prince Valiant, Little Orphan Annie, High and Lois, many oh, things. <laughs> and uh, so I started assisting him on long weekends. I would train up or fly up from DC to, uh, to New York and spend a long weekend with him. And uh, I, I graduated from what was then called doing the blacks. And this meant filling in everything that was solid black to chain mail for Prince Valiant. And this was a crucible. I must say. Uh, if you've done chain mail for Prince Valiant, everything else is easy. <laughs> um, how I got into comics, um, into mainstream comics, was through Tex. Uh, he introduced me to Joe Orlando, then uh, editor at DC Comics, and I started because I absolutely wasn't interested in superhero comics. I was a great fan of Batman. He had been my favorite comic book character all my life, ever since I was a kid. But there was somebody else doing Batman then. So, um, so I worked on Plop. I was living on the West Coast in San Francisco at this time. And I was the first artist uh, who mailed in work. At that time, everybody who worked on comics lived in New York. But Plop wasn't a coming out every week type of thing, so I did work from, uh, from the West Coast. Uh, Tex was a tenderhearted, I mean, uh, Joe was a tenderhearted person, and he knew everybody since the beginning of time. So these should have been retired writers would uh, submit stories that had some ideas but were not funny. So I would rewrite them in order to make them funny and then draw them. Um, I did a few other things for, uh, for DC, um, uh, House of Mystery. They were all the kind of fringe comics that were going on then. Um, I didn't even hear about underground comics until, um, until I moved out to the West Coast. <clears throat> and it seemed that it was a great, this was a great idea, that uh, you could do anything you wanted. Uh, you, you actually didn't have an editor, which was uncomfortable at first, but I got used to it. Uh, and. Uh, and you could do any kind of story you wanted, complete freedom. Um, only after I had gotten into it did I discover the disadvantage. There was no money. <laughs> oh well. So, um, uh, and I found my first tribe. Uh, being an artist is often uh, extremely lonely, you're all by yourself in front of the drawing board, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but with women's comics, I, I found a tribe. And we didn't know each other uh, before this started. Uh, Pat Moodian, who was a, um, uh, an employee of Ron Turner of Last Gas Comics, came up with the idea. And so a cluster of women started out. Uh, you need to go to the panel tomorrow at 4 o'clock, uh, women's at 50, to hear the full, deep story. <laughs> um, we, there were lots of things that uh, came out of this. 
um, in addition to the wonderful friends that I've kept all my life. Um, uh, but what I'm most well known for is Pudge Girl Blimp. This is the complete Pudge Girl Blimp um, with a foreword by Gloria Steinem. I got to know her when the women's comics people wanted to uh, submit an ad in, women, in Ms. Magazine for women's comics. And we sub they demanded that we send them copies of the comics which was totally outrageous. My God, naked people. <laughs> um, but uh, because I was going back and forth uh, twice a year to New York for comics business, I, uh, I dropped in and she took me out to lunch and we got to be good friends over the years uh, with a back blurb by Alison Bechtel. This is because this is one of the first two or three instances of uh, lesbianism. <laughs> um, so that's sort of its claim to fame. Um, actually, storytelling um, not only has been the hallmark of my career, um, but, and and how this is in context, um, I've worked in movies, in games, in, uh, in the medical field, every single anything you can think of that has to do with art. And the, and the way that I was able to hip scotch around, or hopscotch, these technical terms, it's... <laughs> I'm so old, they're kind of drifting away from my brain, um, was storytelling. Um, of course, storytelling, as you all know, has been around forever. Uh, the Native Americans organized their history around storytelling, uh, oral uh, versions of how the monster bear ate so-and-so. But then he got his revenge by blah, 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 blah. Um, <clears throat> it's all oral. And it turns out now that there are various scientists who discover, amazing, that people remember stories and any kind of information as stories better than just having the information handed to them. I'm sure you remember in all of your classes, if somebody came up with why this particular algorithm uh, will make sure a bridge won't fall, it was easier to remember than if you just had to memorize a formula. So you're, you're plugging into the primitive zeitgeist when you tell a story. So this involves uh, our self-images, who we see ourselves as, um, what stories we tell about ourselves. Um, when I first moved out to the West Coast, I was delighted because at different parties, when you would get introduced to somebody and you would say, they would say, well, what do you do? And on the East Coast, people would say, I work for so-and-so bank, or I'm a lawyer and do blah, 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 blah. But on the West Coast, invariably, people would say, I work for a blank, a bank, but I'm a violinist, and would go on and talk about music. So how you see yourselves, or what you say when somebody says, what do you do? Or what is your enthusiasm? means who you are. Um, we organize lives, lives this way. How we, um, how we look about the past, how we project to the future, um, the, the stories that we tell about the past. Whereas at one time in high school, maybe you thought this about what your dad did and didn't do, 
once you got to be in your 20s, you realized why he was doing this or not doing this, and the story changes. And uh, this is a great source of storytelling information for all of us, our pasts, and how you project into the future. Um, you plan to do this by this time, um, you, and how it connects to your past is another example of storytelling. And actually, we order the universe. Um, those of you who are philosophers, not many people list that when asked, what do you do? But there are some people who are more interested in the deeper questions about what's going on. Um, we're going through tumultuous times now. Uh, we've been through really tumultuous times, but I think every generation thinks that. Um, and comes up with stories about what's going on or what used to go on but now doesn't go on anymore. Uh, and, and finding other people who have these stories in common with you is an essential part of how being in the world goes. <clears throat> so getting more specifically to storytelling in comics, um, short, short stories can be like jokes. They have a, a setup and then there's a punchline. This is a good example. Big fat bee is buzzing around bored. Bee surveys the flower field. A huge sunflower sways in the breeze. Bee sights the sunflower, flies near. The sunflower engulfs him dramatically, and the sunflower burps. <laughs> so this has an introduction, a kind of development, and a satisfactory end. If you're working on anything longer than just a joke, <clears throat> and all of these, uh, all these slides are going to be on my website after Monday. I fly back Sunday, so <laughs> Monday they'll be on my website. Um, so you can check them out there, there then. Um, you need an, uh, you have a main point. I'm a Virgo, so I operate from being organized. <laughs> Some of you may just have a feeling about something and start sketching. Um, those things go in my sketchbook, but I rarely develop them as stories. Um, you got a main point, and this is what you want the story, the entire story to be. Uh, it can be uh, might makes right. That's all of the Marvel Universe. <laughs> <laughs> or it could be more poetic. <clears throat> um, and you need characters. Um, developing characters or coming across characters <clears throat> is a little harder for most people. Uh, I had planned um, Pudge Girl Blimp to be a, a personal story. And so I had been a childhood intellectual, four years older than I was chronologically. And, um, and I was, you know, and so I more or less lived in the world of adults, not my contemporaries. But as I began drawing the lead character, she continued to be this plump, dumb looking kid. <coughs> and, you know, like 10 years younger than I planned. Uh, and no matter how much I tried to change the character, the drawing persisted in being this plump little character. So I figure, okay. <laughs> so, <clears throat> and the stories in Pudge 
are all true stories, but they're the stories of my friends. So one story was about a job that she got. Another friend had problems with her bosses. Another friend found living in a commune a complete nightmare. So these all became stories for Pudge. Um, and this was, this was recommended to me by Gilbert Shelton of the f fabulous furry Freak Brothers. <clears throat> um, I wanted uh, some advice from him about uh, the underground comics world. <clears throat> and, and so he said the best thing to do, of course this is what he had done, so naturally he thought the best thing to do was to put up a set of characters and have all the adventures be that one character. And he said, and by the third book, you may get some fans. <laughs> so, uh, so characters you'll usually need. And you need an environment. Um, in Pudge Girl Blimp, it's San Francisco. But depending, interestingly, depending on the environment of your story, it can have a real effect on what the story constitutes. Um, and so you might think of a story and then you think, where, where is this best set? Um, <clears throat> and in regard to the style or attitude or tone, if you are naturally sarcastic, that can be in your story. Do you, are you naturally ironic? That can be in your story. Uh, if you're an earnest, sincere person, that can be how the story runs. Um, it needs to be natural to you. And whatever attitude you have, it can sometimes fit with the story and sometimes not. It depends. For years, I did stories that were parodies of commercials and various things um, that were uh, running around at the time. It was easy because there was a format that was already set up by the commercial or whatever. <clears throat> and so, um, so doing a parody of it was dead easy. Uh, and if you look at the graphic novels in particular, um, there's often a tone or an attitude that's like movies. So, the level of contrast or drama. Um, on the one hand, at the climax of the story, um, the girl can get a date for the prom, and that's a perfectly good story. Or, on the other hand, the universe gets blown up. <laughs> Again, the Marvel Universe. <laughs> um, and and working out how to, to balance the story in that way. Um, it's good to work out before you're inking your next to the last page, when you suddenly realize, uh-oh, I need to blow everything up. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. uh, <clears throat> point of view, there are three points of view. Um, there's the first person point of view, that's you yourself, and everything you see and everything that happens is from your own point of view. Um, this is good in you have a sense of being buried in the story, or everybody who, um, who reads the story will get immersed in the story, if you're good. Um, but it has limitations because there's no way, if the whole story is from the first person's point of view, to perhaps inform the story of things that the writer or the creator hasn't seen or experienced herself. Um, there's the second point of view, uh, which is like you're standing beside what's happening. Um, you're in a high school hallway and you're seeing two friends interact. It's as though you're the invisible 
third person. And then there's the third person point of view, which is the universal point of view. <clears throat> you have a broader range, more possibilities. Most often comic book stories or novels or especially movies will have a mix of these points of view in order to cover all the information they want to cover. Um, an example is, um, it's on the beaches of Normandy, it's D-Day. Uh, first person point of view would be you're in the water, you're getting shot at, uh, you're trying to get through the barbed wire. Uh, second person point of view is you're on the beach, you see the people around you who are getting shot or blown up or running as fast as they can. And the third person point of view is the, the battle. You've got the ships in the harbor, the landing gear, the people on the beach, the, um, the machine guns uh, on the cliffs. And, and that also is a valuable point of view because you can see the rush of people, you can see what's going on in a way that if you had just a first person point of view, you couldn't manage. <clears throat> Audience. This is obvious. Most comic book stories are aimed at one's own peers. They're your friends or, uh, or your generation or the people you want to convince of something. Uh, and that's easy. I'll talk a little bit more about this later on. Um, Lastly are plot structures, and traditionally this is the Western plot structure. Um, every movie, every novel um, you've ever run across. Uh, the beginning is where uh, the characters are introduced, you see who's relative to whom, and then the development is what develops. And then there's a climax. It's the most important event or element in the story. And then if you're on the East Coast, it's the denouement. <laughs> but if you're on the West Coast, it's just called the wrap up. Uh, and that's tidying up the loose ends. This isn't the only way to structure a story. Uh, there's several, but um, <clears throat> there's the twist ending. Um, although this was greatly publicized by <clears throat> Rod Sterling's Twilight Zone and is the subject of um, several movies, uh, and it was the way most horror stories and horror comic books were arranged, um, but the ability to have surprise endings, which is also what this is called, was really sort of hard to do, particularly after the third season of The Twilight Zone. Um, also, and this style was publicized, um, it's called the haiku structure, uh, from Japan. Um, it leaked into the United States through um, online stories. Um, it's a little more poetical uh, and a lot of uh, Japanese and Korean um, stories are, are based on this kind of structure. You just meet the characters as the story goes along. And then there, the description or what, what is, is actually going on <clears throat> gets more and more complicated and then something happens. <clears throat> and then that's it. <clears throat> um, and it, my favorite example of this is, um, it's a poem called Summer. 
And the first line is, I wonder in what fields he plays. My little boy who ran away. So you have a character, the character is introduced, and there's a little bit of development, and then at the end you realize what's happened. Um, any one uh, or more of these, there are different more uh, plot structures, but these are the main ones that I could tell. Um, whichever one appeals the most to you is the way to go. If you come up with a story idea, and you can be an artist or a writer, you come up with a story idea and you work it out. And whichever, any of these is okay. Another um, technique I've discovered over the years that's extremely valuable are post-its. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> um, so with post-its, you can build an idea and you can change your mind endlessly because instead of having to rewrite them or put in all of the massive indications that we all do whenever we're rewriting even a letter, you just pop out a couple of post-its and pop a couple of different ones in. Um, there's actually a format for this. It's called the Layout Planner. And uh, this is, this for an example, is how I did the complete pudge. But um, in working this out, I would realize, oh, this needs to happen sooner, so I would just take those post-its out and write down a few more things and replace them. Um, the yellow here is the main plot and the pink is a dream that I decided the lead girl could have. And this is when um, this mad motorcyclist uh, swerved them. Great technique. So, you can do, um, for the most part, you either are doing a personal story, um, either for yourself or your friends, and, or uh, if you are a professional or if you have an editor, uh, I, I had an editor from hell this last year. <coughs> I was doing things you do for free. They are the worst clients in the world. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so I was doing a COVID Chronicles story for uh, the University of Pennsylvania Press. And this was a fundraising book. Um, for various um, writers and artists and such who needed help during the COVID. Um, and uh, so I, I sent out a treatment, which she loved, but then she had just this thing and I would change this thing. And then she had this other thing. <laughs> But this other thing related to three other things before it. So <clears throat> the amount of time I spent debating with this editor was equal to the amount of time I took to create this story. Very frustrating process. Um, <clears throat> but if you're on assignment, if you're working for the mainstreams or anybody else, that's different than working for yourself. Um, if you're doing a personal story, um, 
it can be as clear or as obscure as you want it to be. It's it's an expression of you. So it can be as obscure or abstract as you like. Um, you can aim this to, uh, to whoever. Uh, that's perfectly fine. And it can be as long or as short as you want. Uh, you have total freedom if you're just doing something. On the other hand, if you're working on assignment, if you're working for other people, you can, as many writers and artists do, uh, inject to the story uh, as much of your personal experience as you can. But <clears throat> it needs total clarity. And this is because if you're doing a Batman story, if you're doing a blue sapphire story, whatever, there are already parameters set in. And this particularly, because if you're doing an already established character, there are certain things that he or she can or can't do. And you need to know what those are going in. So being familiar with this character really helps. Um, and there's a specific audience already set up for the character. Uh, so you need to know the audience in order to help you create the story. Um, there's always a specific length. And, and actually, this is a good thing. Because if you're just riffing, <clears throat> you really don't have any idea of the pacing, <clears throat> of the emphasis, or a lot of things. But if you have an assigned link, you know if it's a five-page story that by page four, you need to be getting to the climax or you need to be getting to the emphasis. One thing that's really hard and is a reason, there's a reason for multiple creators off of the continuing titles is that uh, there needs to be a sort of cliffhanger feeling at the end of each story. And to manage this week after week is really difficult. So that's another. But of course, on the other hand, you get money. <laughs> um, so I think the word for personal personal stories is freedom. And the word for professional stories is parameters. <clears throat> so uh, another aspect to this is where did you get your ideas? Um, and after doing this for most all of my life, um, I find stealing things is the best way <laughs> to get ideas. Um, you can steal them from real life or someplace else. We're not going to discuss somewhere else because I'm liable and whatever. So, <laughs> but um, you can, you need to, if you're a writer or an artist, you need to be aware all of the time that what people are saying and what they're doing around you is a source of material. <clears throat> so um, the, the modern world has provided us with cell phones. So you can be sitting in a cafe and you begin to overhear the conversation at the next table. It might not be fascinating or overwhelming, but something about it really strikes you. And so you can record the conversation <laughs> on your cell phone. <clears throat> Surreptitiously, of course. Uh, so uh, for years, 
before cell phones were invented. I know you're surprised that I was around before cell phones were invented. <laughs> I carried a, a little notebook and, and came up with a personal shorthand of, in order to be able to record people's conversations. Um, and this works also with sketches as well. Um, and in regard to sketchbooks, uh, you can have, uh, although I personally use the 8 half by 11 size sketchbook, many people have smaller sketchbooks. And if you see something, if you see a person, if you see an interaction, if you see a particular view that is compelling to you, if you're not on a train, you can sketch it. And it doesn't have to be elaborate. <clears throat> They're just notes to yourself. Uh, sketches are usually notes to yourself if you're an artist, because you'll know that the sky is supposed to be this kind of blue and this silhouettes to that, etc. And um, the story I always tell, I started um, ske with sketchbooks and notes um, when I was in junior high school. And when I was in high school, I came up with what I thought was a, a great idea. Um, and when I was in my mid-30s, a project came along and I remembered from 15 years before when I had thought of this particular idea, and I used it. It was greatly satisfying. <laughs> and my mate said, damn, this is why you're a clutter bug. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is another example, um, MTV, briefly, um, well, for six months at least, wanted to um, run a series of, anima of animated series. Uh, they, had, they had 10 slots, and so um, over the next, I was uh, doing freelance work for Colossal Pictures at the time, and uh, so on a, a pad that I had around with me all the time, I uh, briefly worked up this extraordinary thing that looks like my studio, actually. It's totally cluttered. Um, but uh, it became sink, tub, and toilet. And we even went to the pencil version of this, but then they abandoned the idea. Somebody else bought MTV rats. But this, it's, this is just for yourself, so it doesn't need to be even legible, as you can tell. Um, you may be forced to, I mean, you may have the opportunity <laughs> to, um, to work with somebody else. Um, my favorite way of doing things is alone, actually, uh, because you can keep flexible throughout the project's duration. Um, if you come up with a better dialogue than the one you originally created, fine. Um, you can do that. Or if you need to transpose things, you can do it. And you don't have to talk to anybody about it. You don't have to send it to committee, to editors, nothing. Um, but occasionally, well, I think for Overall, the comic book industry mostly involves having um, one person who has a partner. Um, and in terms of dealing with, uh, with somebody else, maybe the typical thing is having somebody write the story and somebody else draw it. Um, and, uh, and this can be a nightmare or it can work out fine. The best deal is to be friends with this person. And if you're not friends already, to really get to be friends. 
because there'll be an openness between you and you can create a better work. Um, and then everybody will be happy. Um, in the mainstream universe, um, you've got a crowd. Um, there's the writer, there's the editor, there's the writer, the penciler, the inker, the letterer, and the colorist. And most often, none of these people meet each other or are even in the same state. Um, so the best thing to do, uh, no matter which of these circumstances you find yourself in, is to get to know the other person's work. If you're, if you're put together with a writer and you're an artist, they can send you samples of their work. Now online, you can check out people's work without even letting them know. <laughs> um, and if you're a writer, it's best if you write to the other person's strengths. No matter what you're interested in, if you can tailor things to uh, be whatever the other person's strength is, that's good. And if you are an artist and you're discussing things with the writer, you should be able to say, uh, what I really like to do is X, Y, or Z. Um, this starts the conversation. It's a version of storytelling. You can say, I'm a person who really likes so-and-so. And hopefully, uh, with openness on both sides, things can work out. Um, there is no solution to the group method. You just have to grin and bear it. <laughs> so there are millions of stories particularly with the internet, it's wonderful, the variety of, of things, and that uh, people have the ability to express themselves without going through editors. I know I've badmouthed them this afternoon. Some few editors are very good. Uh, Archie Goodwin comes to mind. Um, and if you're not having a way <clears throat> to get your ideas out, either as an artist or a writer, you can do something and put it online. And then whoever you talk to, whoever uh, you're perhaps maybe going to do business with, you can just refer them to your website, which is what I do now. It's leemars.com. How hard is this? <laughs> but it's two R's in Mars, not one. If I were M-A-R-R-S, I would be part of the Mars Candy Company. And I wouldn't be here. I'd be on the tropical island that I owned. <laughs> and you would never see me. So. Questions. And before you ask questions, hopefully some of you will have them, um, I, they should be actual questions. <laughs> Not your chance to hold forth on your own opinions about anything for posterity. Yes? Um, so, when, so when you're doing a story, when you're telling a story, um, is it, do you have to write ahead of time where you want this character to, develop, to, develop, to a character to develop? Or as you, can, as you start writing on from when you start, or does the ideas of where you want that character to go continue as you write the story and continue? So the question was, um, I think, uh, how do you develop the story? 
do you start with characters or do you develop the characters as you go along? Yeah, that's yeah. the answer is no. <laughs> um, you should have your characters worked out in your head before you start the story. I think that's universally. You. Uh, I'm just wondering, um, what is it generally about stories in general that appeal to you, that make them meaningful, interesting? Um, he asks, what does what is meaningful to stories from me? Mm -hmm. um, I think they are a way to order my world. Um, if I'm making them up, that could be uh, how I wish things would be, or I'm condemning something because it isn't this way, and, and I explore how that is in the story. But what's satisfying about doing stories is that you've created a unit that is outside of yourself and that everybody who runs across it can grok it, we hope. Uh, it seems that you have some disdain for editors. <laughs> uh, do you have any tips or anything for maybe working with them better so that you can uh, you know, still maybe do what you want to do, kind of, or a good way to compromise with them? Um, He's commenting on my disdain for editors. <laughs> and is there a way to communicate with the editor that would be more pleasurable? <laughs> I think getting to know uh, the editors is a, is, a good, is a good first point. You can see what books that they already edit because that's what, that's, those are the kinds of stories that they like. And so you can discuss things um, and, and work them out rather than just have them denounce whatever you've created. Yes? Uh, you touched upon how the, uh, in the age of the internet, it's very easy for people to put their stories out there. Would you say that the internet is the most efficient not the most efficient or the most effective like ground floor way of getting getting your ideas out there or do you think there's other more traditional outlets of finding common work? Um, he asks is there a more traditional way of getting comic stories sold or connected or is the internet the best way to get stories out and get discovered? Um, I think any possible way mm -hmm. is the best way. But the ground floor best way is getting things out on the internet. Because this can be a reference and it can be much more volumetric than any other way um, that you can manage it. But if your next door neighbor happens to publish, that's a great way. It doesn't, because traditionally it's who you know. It's always been who you know. So that isn't to be dismissed as a good way of getting along. Oh, thanks. I, you know, I was wondering earlier, with regard to your name, Lee, L-E-E, -E, did you choose that to help you get through the door? I heard that your original birth name. Uh, she asks, did I choose Lee or is that my original name? Um, it's my original name. I was named after my grandmother, Ruby Lee Chestnut, and, and, she, and she was named for Robert E. Lee. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Yes? Uh, when you were talking about collaboration, I immediately thought of your work with um, Cohampton on Viking Prince and the 
Miss Tom Morocco on uh, the Fana. And those books do seem like really well written for those particular artists' strengths. So if you can talk a little bit about how you, you tailor those stories specifically to those artists. Um, my favorite artist that I worked with, and for the, for the mainstream, my way, mainstream work is mostly scripts. Um, and so my favorite artist was Leo Durignano. Um, and I did the Indiana Jones books with him. And he was wonderful. Uh, I learned quickly that although my favorite way of telling stories is having something in the foreground happening and something in the background happening. He didn't like to do that. So I, it turned out things happening in the front, front were the only way to go. But with Bo Hampton, um, he was chosen by Mike Gold, the editor. And this was his first story. And he worked in watercolor. And I think the story, to my mind, was about 40% okay. Uh, but he, he forgot some essential things that were in the script. And actually, we had to use color Xerox to kind of paste some extra panels in in order to cover that. Um, and because it was a, it had a twist ending, which didn't come off at all because again, um, he had forgotten an element. So it was more trouble, I think, than it was worth. But it gave him a good example. I actually got to meet him years later at uh, the Comic-Con, the San Diego Comic-Con, and, um, and he said that uh, he had learned from working with other writers that I was a really good writer. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's all the yeah. time we have. I want to thank Lee.